Before discussing the poem itself, we need to spend some time getting to know the Anglo-Saxon culture a bit better. Anglo-Saxon views of community and king, exile and justice, are particularly important concepts for understanding this poem. In fact, you can't understand the the point of the poem without understanding uh, several things about Anglo-Saxon culture. These social roles, Anglo-Saxon social roles, also form thematic threads of the poem's interlaced structure. The poet evaluates individual characters based on whether they conform to or rebel against the idealized norms of these roles. Beowulf's own heroism depends on how well he measures up to these ideals. In order to understand the meaning of this poem, we need to understand how these social roles shaped and framed Anglo-Saxon culture and society. For the Anglo-Saxons, nature was a dangerous, unknown, unpredictable realm that constantly threatened the survival of the community. Only in community could the Anglo-Saxons have any fighting chance to exist as a people, which made community a matter of life and death, and the, the loyalty and fulfilling of each person's individual social role became a, a, a matter of life and death. The, the health of the community, the survival of the community, depended on how well each member submitted to and performed his particular social role. Because the community could be threatened at any time, there were particular social roles that were essential, that were more important than others. The first is that of the ring giver, or the king. The ring giver, the Bea Gifa, or the king, Kininga, was, uh, the king was also known as a ring giver or a treasure giver. He was expected to be a skilled warrior, fierce in battle, but also to maintain, he also was expected to maintain the loyalty and devotion of his warriors by giving generous gifts of treasure to reward his warriors' bravery. He would sit on his, on his throne, which was called in Anglo-Saxon the giftstol, the gift throne, when, and he would sit there when the community gathered in the mead hall, the meduseld, the building at the center of the community. And as the community feasted, he would reward his thanes by giving them treasures out of his out of his stores of gold and heirlooms and plunder that he had gathered during his years of war. The second social role is that of the warrior itself, or in Anglo-Saxon, the thane. The thanes were the king's warriors, expected to fight loyally for the king and seeking to win him honor through their war skill. They knew that the harder they fought for the king, the more glory he would receive, and in turn, the greater his generosity would be to them, which would then increase their glory and their reputation. Together, the king and thanes form what was called the comitatus, which is actually a Latin word, but we'll use it throughout. It's it's the warrior fellowship that formed the backbone of the heroic Anglo-Saxon culture. The society, any, any society in this culture stood or fell on the well-being of the comitatus, on the relationship between the king and his thanes. The third social role that's important to understand is that of the blood avenger. In Anglo-Saxon culture, murder and manslaughter were punished through a system of blood vengeance. Either a kinsman of the slain would kill the slayer, or the slayer would offer a blood price, a weirgild, as the monetary restitution for the person slain. Dealing with blood guilt is essential for the stability of Anglo-Saxon communities, but the Beowulf poet, as we'll see, treats blood feuds as ironic and never-ending, which is actually a, 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 common, a common theme in classical and, and pagan literature. The fourth social role uh, is that of the peace weaver, or the Freyathuweba, One way of ending blood feuds between different tribes was through a peace weaver, a woman who would unite the two tribes through intermarriage and the bearing of children, which would literally weave the two bloodlines together. In theory, the two tribes would become relatives and the fighting would cease. This role was essential to Anglo-Saxon culture, though as we'll see in Beowulf, it is often inadequate to quell bloodlust. The peace weaver also poured ceremonial drinks of mead, which was uh, mead as beer made from honey, when the comitatus gathered in the mead hall and the king sat on his gift throne. These ceremonial drinks reiterated the bonds between thane and king and helped helped preserve peace. 
And we'll see some examples of, of the peace weaver and giving the ceremonial drinks. The fifth social role is that of the shope. When SC appears together in Anglo-Saxon, it's pronounced uh, the same way that SH is pronounced in modern English, shope. The shope was the bard who sang the oral history and the living memory of his people. His songs were often structured to give, were often structured to give instruction to those who listened, and he would often immortalize warriors through his song. The sixth important social role, or social reality, I guess, is called is is that of the exile or the reka. For the Anglo-Saxons, exile from the community meant a living death. A man without a lord, without a community, was essentially a monster. He would become an earth walker, wandering the earth and hoping someone would accept him into their community. Grendel, as we'll see in, in the next reading, Grendel suffers from generational exile, and so the sounds coming from the mead hall of celebration rub salt in, his, in an age-old feud. A few other literary tropes that are important uh, to understand the poetry and how it works. Uh, the first one is alliteration, which is simply the repetition of initial consonant sounds. For example, in the fourth line of the poem, uh, Seamus Heaney translates it, there was shield chiefson, scourge of many tribes. You can see the alliteration of the S's there. Alliteration occurs in every line of the original poem, uh, usually three alliterations per line. That was a standard uh, poetic line in Old English. This alliteration uh, and the number three gives the poetry both rhythm and order. Seamus Heaney uses modern English alliteration in masterful ways to capture the, the effect that the Old English had. The second trope is called a kenning, which is a compound noun constructed from two other words. Kennings have the effect of metaphors, giving the word signified more poetic weight. For example, whale road uh, is the sea, bone house is the body, uh, and then one from directly from Old English, meduweri literally means mead weary. And you can, you can hear that in the pronunciation of the word meduweri, which means drunk or beer tired. The third literary device is that of irony, which is more a mode of perception than a literary device. Irony is a mode of perception that recognizes a difference between reality and appearance. And irony pervades this poem, usually in tragic, uh, very tragic ways. And fourth is that of elegy, which is a mournful lament. Though Beowulf is not an elegy specifically in form or purpose, it does have an elegiac tone throughout, a recognition that all things in this world are temporary and fleeting kingdoms as well as individuals. And the elegiac tone uh, increases as we move through, and we'll see that as we read through the poetry. That's enough introduction for now. Let's get into the poetry itself. <laughs> 